The witch is easy to find scattered throughout popular media. She is a mysterious, cunning trickster, a poisoner and murderer in league with the devil who drinks the blood of children and dances naked in the woods under a full moon. Anxieties surrounding witchcraft have been pervasive throughout history, most famously exemplified by the Salem Witch Trials and in more recent memory demonstrated throughout the horror film canon. Regardless of the inspiration for these witch characters, they are always to be feared. But at her most base level, the witch is a woman who has taken control of herself, of her environment, and of her beliefs. Therefore, the fear of witches reveals a host of latent societal beliefs. The witch and the conjuring both explore the effects of rigid religious structures, patriarchy, and capitalism on women and the natural world, resulting in the creation of witches and the monstrous feminine. All right, babes, go ahead and stop scrolling for me. If you're seeing this video, it means this tarot message is meant for you. Okay, take what resonates, leave what doesn't, babes. Okay, take what resonates. We have the Empress, meaning you're pregnant. Okay, we actually have the Ace of Swords, which means you need to go commit a crime. Ten of Cups, okay, get drunk tonight. Get out there. The vibes in here are just so still. Hold still for a cleansing. All right, that's just gonna simmer while we do this. Hi, welcome back. Yes, I got a tattoo since the last video. Don't talk about it. I don't want to see any comments about my gorgeous, cute, adorable, slay new tattoo. I don't want to hear any comments telling me how much of a badass I am, okay? I already know. Please, it's too much. It's a pine tree. <laughs> so you can probably tell that this one's a little different from my past videos. A little more academic, perhaps. A little more Times New Roman size 12, if you will. For my gender and horror cinema class, we have the option to make a video essay instead of writing a very official academic paper. So obviously I'm doing that. So this video is functionally my final paper for a college gender studies course released to the web. So it's gonna get a little political here. Sound the political siren. We're talking capitalism, we're talking patriarchy, we're talking organized religion. If you know this kind of conversation is going to be triggering for you in any way, feel free to kindly click away and I'll see you in the next somewhat less topical video. Hope you enjoy. Comment what grade you think I should get, but only if it's an A. Let's get into it. Witches. How do you define a witch? This is a question I've been thinking about a lot this year. If you couldn't tell from the everything about me, I'm a little bit of a hippie. I'm a friend of Stevie Nicks. I have a rock collection and I like to pay attention to what phase the moon is in. Sue me. If that's a crime, lock me up. You can't actually though, because it's not 1630. But the word witch is such a loaded term. There's sort of a reclamation and resurgence of the word in modern Wiccan and neo-pagan circles to describe practitioners of certain ritualistic and earth-based spiritualities. However, the word witch does not refer to any one set of beliefs. It's not dogmatic or structured. In the modern understanding of the word, people who call themselves witches don't all believe in the same god or agree on the same set of moral mandates or follow any kind of centralized hierarchy. It's a self-identifier for people who take a more naturalistic approach to spirituality, any spirituality. There are Jewish people who identify as witches, Christian witches, atheist witches, and every other possible identity in between. It's hard to really set a definition with such a wide array of beliefs and practices under a single umbrella term which is sort of the point. <laughs> it's a radical decentralizing of spiritual practice away from the rigid structures and hierarchies and back to the people and to the earth. If self-identifying witches could all be said to share one thing, it's a deep connection to and through nature. Surely there's something a little witchy in all of us. Who among us hasn't taken a walk through the woods and felt our spirit grow a little bit lighter or made a wish on a star? So then why the word witch? Why not naturalistic spiritual practitioner or non-denominational universalist mystic. Well, despite just being a mouthful, <laughs> I think the word witch has made a perfect catch-all term for these sets of beliefs because the word itself is a bit of an F you to everything wrong with organized religion. Remember the Salem witch trials when they killed a bunch of women for not conforming to one very specific patriarchal and puritanistic reading of the Bible that said that women were inherently more likely to be damned for all time? Not our shining moment as a species. The word witch calls to mind and rejects this kind of ideological suppression saying, yeah, if that's what this whole organization is about, then go ahead and call me a heretic because I'm like not down. And regardless of what you believe in, I think we can all agree that the humans in charge of these rigid religious structures have done quite a bit of damage. And it's those oppressive structures that the word witch is in opposition to. Not necessarily the idea of religion itself, but rather the way it has been historically twisted and implemented for purposes of oppression. For simplicity's sake, I'm gonna be using the word religion or religious structures to refer to this twisting of religion for conformist and oppressive aims, and the word spirituality to refer to the more innate sense of spiritual connection. So for the purposes of this video, 
video, religion is like the mom from the movie Carrie being horrible to her daughter because she got her period because she thinks it's like a sign of sin. Whereas spirituality is more like in the beginning of God's spell where everyone hears a mysterious shofar solo and leaves like their jobs and daily lives and runs into a random fountain and dances together and it's like a symbol of human community. God, I love God's spell. No one watches my God's spell video essay because nobody knows what God's spell is. So help me, I will make another. That movie slaps. But as you can see, we have examples of both religion and spirituality both having to do with Christianity. So suffice it to say, I am not talking down everything about religion or all religions. Obviously. Religion is oftentimes just the avenue of spiritual connection people need and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I am just analyzing the harmful effects of these giant structures that end up influencing our laws, our culture, and our day-to-day -day life regardless of if we are a part of them or not. Even Jesus talked down the overzealous oppressive religious leaders of his time. Remember they were the ones always trying to stone everybody? So. There's a precedent set for this kind of thing, okay? Also, I'm going to be referring often to women and patriarchy and misogyny throughout this thing. And I wanna state that this includes all feminine identifying people. And even beyond that, really any marginalized group. I use the word woman a lot because these specific characters in these films that I'm focusing on are cis women, but I do not mean to exclude anyone's experiences with the subject in any way. Oppression is often intersectional and you may resonate with the experience of the women in these films regardless of your identity. And I want to acknowledge up front that the claims I'm making here really apply to anyone who can relate to them. This topic is a deep one and there's plenty of room for further conversation about how these systems affect people of all races, backgrounds, and gender identities. Representation in Hollywood is not the greatest though, so for these examples we happen to be working within a particular demographic. In summary, stream the new ContraPoints JK Rowling video. I think that's probably enough time spent on the disclaimer. What do you think? Should we get into it? What I'm looking to analyze through these two chosen films is rigid religious structures, patriarchy, and capitalism, these systems that are so deeply ingrained in our society and their effects on both women and the environment and how this ironically pushes women to find kinship with the environment and therefore turn into witches. As you can see, it's a loaded one. Let's do it. From the moment we watched this movie, I knew I was gonna be talking about it because if I cared even just like 2% less than I currently do about how I'm perceived in society, I would dress like a pilgrim every single day of my life. Laugh it up now, but when Mayflower Corps becomes the big new thing in 2024, you know who started it. The Witch, or as I like to call it, the Vavitch, is a New England folk tale directed by Robert Eggers following a Puritan family as they are banished from their settlement for being too puritanical. <laughs> so right from the jump, we have a clear understanding that this family is not only part of a rigid religious structure, but they are so rigid that arguably one of the most rigid religious groups ever was even like, you guys need to chill. So the family, made up of Father William, Mother Catherine, Icon Thomason, portrayed masterfully by Anya Taylor-Joy, and her somewhat less relevant siblings, Caleb, Mercy, Jonas, and Samuel, make their own farm and immediately shit hits the fan. Thomason is playing peekaboo with infant Samuel one day and in the split second her eyes are closed he vanishes presumably yoinked by a witch. Boo! <laughs> Boo! This is the kind of intrusive thought fuel that makes me afraid to sneeze while driving because I think the one millisecond my eyes are closed I'm gonna go careening off a cliff so thank you for that Robert. Since Thomason was the only person there when Samuel went missing there's a bit of suspicion that Thomason somehow witched Samuel away herself. And there's especially suspicion from her twin siblings Mercy and Jonas which it's just some Olympic level mental gymnastics on their part because they're the ones that are always effing around with the one black goat the family owns named Black Philip, who's just absolutely the devil. You should stop that! Philip! Be fucking for real right now. Anyway, Caleb is targeted next, returning from the woods with some mysterious illness. He then throws up a rotten apple to show us that sin has taken place. And then the twins, Mercy and Jonas, can't remember the Our Father prayer all of a sudden, and Caleb dies. So William goes feral and locks all his surviving children in a shed thing, giving very much House of Anubis. And in the morning, the twins are gone, Black Philip kills William, Catherine tries to kill Thomason, and Thomason self-defense is Catherine to death. It's intense, I was really scared. How many people were scared? Me too. I was really, really scared. Then Black Philip reveals that he is, in fact, just absolutely the devil from the Bible. What dost thou want? And says if Thomason joins him, she can live deliciously. Soar, she gets naked and walks into the woods, and there's sort of a cute little meetup happening with the girlies. It's kind of Taylor Swift Willow Live on the Eras tour vibes. Yes! 
summon the demon snitch! So, okay, let's get serious. Serious face. How was Thomason pushed to make this decision? What forces or structures failed her or outright hurt her to make her feel like there was no other option? What made her a witch? Because she wasn't at the beginning. Let's be clear, there was suspicion, but she was never the witch. Well, first of all, and maybe most obviously, restrictive puritanical religious and governmental structures. <laughs> As I mentioned before, the family is banished from their puritanical settlement for being too puritanical, which is a hard thing to do. Throughout the movie, we get a lot of Puritan talk about how women are more sinful than men, the father is the head of the family, and everyone is predestined for hell unless they change their ways, reinforcing patriarchal and misogynistic beliefs. There's a scene after Samuel goes missing when Caleb is asking his dad if Samuel is in hell since he was too young to have been baptized yet, and the dad is like, yeah, basically, yeah. Puritanical theology here is essentially that humans, and women in particular, are inherently evil unless saved by God. In her book Braiding Sweetgrass, Robin Wall Kimmerer examines the differences between this kind of theology and indigenous beliefs as she retells the indigenous creation myth of Sky Woman Fallen. As the story goes, in the beginning of time, a hole opened up in Sky World, and a woman fell down through the hole towards the water, where all the animals caught her and brought up mud from the bottom of the water to hold her, which formed land and created Turtle Island aka Earth. As she was falling, the woman had tried to grab onto the tree of life and took a few branches down with her, and in return for the animal's kindness, she uses the branches to plant every plant in the world. Kimmerer highlights the ideological differences spawned by raising generations on this myth versus the Christian creation story of Adam and Eve. On the one hand, we have a story about nature's generosity and kinship with humans, and especially with women, and how the women and the earth care for each other. And on the other hand, we have a story where a woman is punished for eating a forbidden fruit, exiled to the earth as a place of punishment, told to tame and subdue the wilderness around her to live. The indigenous spirituality portrayed in the story of Sky Woman breeds a greater care and respect for the natural world and for women, in comparison with the Adam and Eve story, which is easily made to be about the inherent sinfulness of women and the harshness of the earth, and the necessity of men to dominate them both. Think about the long-term effects of this becoming the dominating belief system. The colonization and destruction of indigenous lands and cultures, the destruction of the earth via capitalist overproduction, the suppression of women by patriarchal systems and purity culture, I want to emphasize here that I'm not saying that one belief system is better or more right than another or that Christianity is always bad. I come from a huge Irish Catholic family. I know better than anybody that the heart of it is well-intentioned. My confirmation name is Beatrice. Drop your confirmation name in the comments below. The point I'm trying to make here is that there are dire real-world long-term effects to basing a dominating world culture around one particularly misogynistic and anti-naturalistic reading of the Bible. Again, this is religious structure versus spirituality. So to bring us back to the witch, the Vavit, we have a puritanical family deeply invested in this particular reading, with women and the earth both as forces to be subdued, dominated, and tamed. In one scene where William is trying to boost morale on the farm, he says, We will conquer this wilderness. It will not consume us. Here we have direct commentary on this belief in the domination of the earth rather than any form of kinship with it. Think about how we often refer to nature as Mother Earth. I am your mother. The earth is often viewed as a mother, as a provider from which all things come. If the natural world and femininity are somehow inherently connected, then doesn't it make sense that a culture that believes in the inherent sinfulness of women would also believe in the inherent harshness of the earth? And therefore, wouldn't it be easy to justify the domination and oppression of both women and the earth in such a culture? In multiple scenes throughout the film, the family sees rabbits in the woods at very pivotal moments, usually in scenes preceding or following the witch's appearances. Old world beliefs of witches being able to turn into cats and rabbits were extremely common. Here we can see the inherent ties between the natural world and women, specifically witches. Furthermore, William is the decided patriarch of the family, with Catherine and the children belonging to him as property. When they start suspecting Thomason of witchery, Catherine and William debate selling her to another family to work for them. These themes of ownership and hatred of women and of the earth are pervasive in this film. This also calls to mind capitalist ideals, as the family sees both the women in the family and the land they live on only in terms of what they can provide or how they can be monetized. For the family to survive, they either need the land to start providing them with crops, or they need to sell their daughter. In one scene after the family's crops start failing, William sells Catherine's prized possession, a family heirloom silver cup, in exchange for hunting equipment in order to survive. He later remains silent when Catherine assumes that Thomason took the cup. This functions on multiple levels. He sold his wife's possession as if it were his own in order to get hunting tools, putting him at direct odds with the natural world rather than working with it as a farmer intending to it, and then allows his daughter to take the fall for him. This anti-naturalistic scarcity mindset is emblematic 
emblematic of capitalism as William tries to come out as the sole victor over both the women around him and the natural world in exchange for money. Thomason is always blamed for the family's misfortune. The family disdains the earth they live on for not being fertile enough for their particular needs. So their ultimate superstition, their mortal enemy, is the idea of a witch, the woman living on her own in the woods, who has joined forces with the natural world around her to take revenge on the culture that tried to tame and oppress them both for monetary and social gain. The ultimate nightmare for a culture so deeply entrenched in misogyny and capitalism is the woman united with the earth. So at the end, when Thomason is left completely alone with nowhere to turn, she takes on the form of this character as the ultimate opposition to this culture that hurt her for its own benefit and took everything from her. She's finally freed from the rigid religious system in which she was raised by taking off her puritanical garb, running into the woods, and dancing naked with some other women. Now, is it a good thing that she's joining up with the literal devil? Probably not. This just in, ultimate figure of evil, probably bad. If I really wanted to stretch my interpretation here, I could maybe say something like, uh, he was Black Philip, so he was an animal and thus an oppressed part of the natural world, but he's just definitely the devil the whole time. <laughs> like, I don't think the family being mean to the goat, like, turned it into the devil. I don't know. I kind of wish he wasn't involved. Like, I think the ending would be stronger for my particular reading of the film if Thomason just wandered into the woods of her own accord and found this group of other runaway women who left at the oppressive society behind and just joined them and left it all rather than just falling under the ownership of another man or I guess half goat, half man. But then it wouldn't be as scary of a movie and it's scary movie, so it has to be evil, creepy, scary. So yes, thank you. Moving on. <laughs> I do exude a little Christian swag and I'm proud to be an American. I think maybe it's telling, concerning, that I didn't like buy any of these outfits for this video. Like I just have like a pilgrim cloak and like a full Lorraine Warren cosplay just in my closet. Okay, The Conjuring. The Conjuring is like weirdly, extremely conservative vibes. And it's really hard to explain what I mean, but I'm gonna try really hard. The Conjuring is like the quintessential horror movie. This family moves into an old house. Their dog refuses to go inside. Supernatural shit starts going down. So they contact this demonologist, supernatural investigator couple named Ed and Lorraine Warren. Lorraine is highly emotional and intuitive and is able to actually see and hear spirits. And Ed is logical, methodical, and will not do anything without the express permission of the Catholic Church. Concern conservative vibes. Pretty much the whole movie, as all the supernatural shit is happening in the house, Ed is just waiting to hear back from the Vatican to get permission to do an exorcism, which he needs because the family isn't part of the church. I'm gonna talk a lot about this in just a second, just, just wait. They discover that an accused witch named Bathsheba hanged herself on the tree in their yard years ago, and it's her spirit that is haunting the house. Bathsheba ends up possessing the mom of the family, Carolyn, and Ed tries to do the exorcism, but it only works because Lorraine reminds the mom of a special memory of her family, and then the power of love makes her strong enough to fight off the demon. Yay! <laughs> so, right off the bat, <laughs> this whole haunting happens because something dark happened on the land that the family moves on to. This, of course, brings colonization to mind. There's a very real and very American anxiety about not knowing what happened on our land because it is stolen. Think about all the horror media you've seen that features an indigenous burial ground of some kind. This preys on our fear of past events or past peoples taking revenge on us for desecrating their land and their culture. And how did all of this happen? Well, people like the Puritans and the Vavitch came to America for religious freedom and infinite opportunity and proceeded to destroy any culture or spiritual practice that wasn't their own. <laughs> and stolen, desecrated those cultures' lands for their own purposes, often for their own monetary gain. In other words, we have a giant system of rigid religiosity and capitalism destroying the natural world and the people who tended it. And as a result, hundreds of years down the line, we have a suburban family moving into a house on bloody land and the land and its people enacting their revenge. These are the anxieties and fears that come along with colonization and capitalism. And as you can see, they are deeply intertwined with conformist religious structures and the destruction of the natural world. Then there's our supernatural investigator couple, the Warrens. Ed and Lorraine are exactly the traditional Christian gender roles. Ed is the brain, Lorraine is the heart. Ed is in charge, Lorraine more or less does what he says. Lorraine is empathetic and caring, sometimes to a fault, and Ed protects her. There's nothing inherently wrong with these being their character traits, but I do think it's interesting given the film's heavy focus on Catholicism. I also find it very interesting that Lorraine is the only one who can actually see and communicate with spirits, but Ed is the one who's like mostly in charge. You could almost say that Ed 
capitalizes off of his wife's supernatural abilities. Hmm. Hmm. It's funny how that works. The most infuriating part of all of this for me is Ed's absolute stickler behavior in following every law the Catholic Church says to the letter. Since the family in the house isn't part of the church, Ed needs permission from the Vatican itself to perform an exorcism in the house. And here's the thing about that. Why? <laughs> there are our lives at stake. What's really gonna happen if you don't get the Pope's express permission? God won't save this innocent family because some old guy in Rome didn't give it the go ahead? This is the problem with these kinds of hierarchies that are so set in stone. They're often antithetical to the actual spiritual beliefs of the religion they're supposed to represent. Isn't God supposed to be like the ultimate chain breaker who loves all of his children equally and helps anyone who calls out to him. So why do we need to go through some other human guy to do that? Well, because we've taken free form spirituality and turned it into a governmental religious structure and injected it with misogynistic and capitalistic ideology. The common man, and especially the common woman, cannot be trusted to interact with spiritual forces on their own because they're sinful and evil and dumb. So instead, they should have to go through a representative of the divine. A man, of course. And only the men in charge can talk to God. And everyone else just needs to wait their permission or ask for their prayers or tell them our sins so that they can tell us if God has forgiven us. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> I'm getting heated. Clearly this is something I have thought about a lot. Let's pull out a book reference and maybe I'll calm down a bit. In The Way of the Rose, an environmentalist couple, Clark Strand, an ex-Buddhist monk, and his wife Perdita Finn, a feminist ex-Catholic, reveal the benefits they've discovered in praying the rosary or Catholic prayer beads. Petition for a Conjuring remake with these two instead of the Warrens. I will fund it myself. This is the rosary. Here, I'll, <laughs> I'll do it like a makeup guru. I got this one at an antique store because it had this weird little latch on the bottom and I figured out that the back opens up and there was like dirt and a little note in there that said it was dirt from the catacombs in Rome. That truly has nothing to do with anything. I just, I just thought it was neat. To pray the rosary, you start at the cross and then you go up and you say a prayer on each bead and you go all the way around in a circle. It's typically used as a devotional tool for the Virgin Mary. Um, these groups of 10 beads, on these you say a Hail Mary on every one of these 10 beads and then only on the ones in between the sets of 10 you say in Our Father. Very much girl boss energy from the rosary. In old world pagan practices, flowers were often woven together as crowns for statues of goddesses which was later absorbed into Catholic practices as the church converted the pagans by incorporating some of their rituals into Catholic beliefs. The legend about the rosary is that the Virgin Mary appeared to a guy named Dominic, subsequently Saint Dominic, and she taught him the rosary as a way to weave a flower crown out of prayers alone. So they say each time you pray the rosary, you're giving the Virgin Mary a little, a little flower crown up in heaven. Very sweet, very cute. Little bit Coachella, I'm into it. The first rosary beads were actually made from melted down roses, hence the name, the rosary. You like get all the moisture out and they turn into like clay and then you can make little, little beads. As you can see from some of the history of the rosary, it exists as a symbol for both the divine feminine and an intimate connection to the earth. One of the first things they point out in the way of the rose is the shape of the rosary. If you look at it, it's the circle with the line and the cross at the bottom. It's the feminine symbol. Crazy. Different branches of Christianity have tried to get rid of the rosary because they feel it puts way too much emphasis on the Virgin Mary and not enough on God and just because it seems kind of witchy in general. But truly, I kind of don't get that because like if you want someone to do something and they're not doing it, you go to their mom, right? Like <laughs> if no one else is gonna get it done, the mother's gonna get it done. I am your mother. The rosary only really still exists today because women kept passing it down. In the Middle Ages, when men could go out and work and women were more or less relegated to the house all day, they would keep their minds occupied while doing the housework by reciting the prayers of the rosary around and around. It was a more personal and accessible form of spiritual practice for them, open to them at any time without anyone's permission. And in the book, Strand and Finn point out how the form of the rosary goes against all the hierarchical ideas we live by in our day and age. Capitalism and rigid religious structures are based on straight lines. In capitalist society, we are always ahead of or behind someone else, always trying to win or get to the top. Churches are built so everyone is facing forward at the priest, at the front of the room, and a little bit above everybody else. In the Catholic Church, you've got the Pope and the Vatican on top, with the bishops and cardinals and priests and everybody below, and then at the very bottom you've got the common man. But the rosary is a circle. There's no winning, there's no advancing, you don't go anywhere, you just go in a circle for the sake of going in a circle. Just think of the image of the typical church setup that I just said versus the image of a group of people sitting in a circle. This is the fundamental image of religion versus spirituality. In a circle, everyone is equal. Everyone can see each other. No one is ahead of or above anyone else. Everyone has 
equal opportunity to share and receive. And this is the way the natural world operates. Everything in nature is a cycle. The seasons, the days, life itself moves in circles. It's the structures of men that move in straight lines. So to bring it back to the conjuring, Ed's absolute obedience to the hierarchy of the Catholic Church is conformity to the straight line culture, to capitalism, to rigid religious structures, to empire. They all follow this straight line attitude. When the ghost possesses the family's mother and Ed tries to do the exorcism, it's only Lorraine's connection to the mother through emotion that saves her. Ed tries to dominate the ghost, straight line. Lorraine tries to level with it and its host, circle. Religion, spirituality. Masculine, feminine. Capitalism, the earth. <laughs> In conclusion, I'm not saying witches are just freelance female priests but that's not not what I'm saying. If given the reins, I do believe Lorraine could have solved the whole situation by herself. So how does this tie in with the witch? The, the witch. Well, remember, the ghost in the house was an accused witch named Bathsheba. Bathsheba is essentially Thomason if she got caught. And then hundreds of years later, someone built a house where her bonfire once stood. Bathsheba is a lot more vicious than Thomason, so it's not the best analogy, but I think the point stands that a witch from a hundred years ago would be shocked at the way the world has changed today. An old world spiritual woman deeply connected to the earth to the cycles of life, wakes up in a society that is all straight lines, concrete, and money. I can see why she would be angry and confused and maybe want to return things to the Earth's natural cycles, possibly by destroying this random family's house. I'm not saying I support it, but I can definitely understand where she's coming from. <laughs> the destruction of the Earth, the suppression of naturalistic spirituality, and oppression of women leaves us with the choice to succumb to these imposed straight lines or to sink ourselves with the cycles of the earth and try to take back our autonomy. And that is what being a witch is. So in both of these films, we can see how domination and destruction of women and the earth by religious structures, patriarchy, and capitalism ironically leads women to becoming witches as a way of reclaiming autonomy. A close connection to the earth means sinking oneself with natural cycles and realizing the detriments of living in a society that ignores those natural cycles in favor of straight lines, hierarchies, and competition. By embracing naturalistic spirituality, women free themselves of the rigid structures of religion and find a more personal and accessible connection to spirituality, one that does not require a man permission. And there is power in this. By rejecting the need for rigid structures, hierarchical thinking, and the capitalist mindset of everything having a winner and a loser, we connect ourselves to the circular movements of the earth and reclaim our power from these structures that have suppressed it. And this poses a threat to these systems that thrive off of conformity and oppression. The witch archetype scares us because she is a free agent outside of society. She does everything opposite to the way we're taught to live. But upon closer inspection, maybe she has the right idea. She doesn't play the game. She is in complete control of herself and her beliefs. She could get that ghost out of your house without needing anybody's permission. She knows her own worth and the worth of the natural world. She's free to live as she pleases. And this is terrifying to a culture that has been taught from our earliest stories to do as we are told and not ask questions, to tame the earth and suppress our natural cycles. The witch knows the power in accepting yourself as you are, in withdrawing from these arbitrary structures of our society, and in finding what feels most true to you. And for most of us, that is a horrifying feat to accomplish. How many people were scared? Me too. I was really, really scared. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you're my professor, hi. I really hope you enjoyed. <laughs> Since this is a final project, you already know I'm about to be on summer break, which means way more time to work on videos. I'm working on one that's been taking a long time because it requires a lot of content consumption, but my schedule's about to open up, so that should hopefully be coming soon. God Emperor of Dune is a novel that exists and maybe someday I'll even talk about it. <laughs> if you didn't know, I also make music. It's on this channel. Go ahead and listen to it if you feel so inclined and watch my other videos if you want. Uh, they're fun. Um, okay, I think that's it. Thanks for watching. Bye!